Welcome to the physics colloquium today. Um, I'm Oskar Halacek and uh, this afternoon it's my real pleasure um, to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Lisa Manning of Syracuse University, where she is the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of Physics and also the director of the Bioinspired Institute. Uh, so very briefly, a couple of words about her career and background. Dr. Manning earned her PhD in physics from US UCSB in 2008, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science. In 2011, she accepted a faculty position at Syracuse University, where she stayed ever since. In 2015, she was promoted to associate professor and then to full professor in 2019. So her research interests are deeply rooted in the physics um, of the glass transition, which is still one of the big unsolved problems, I would say, in classical physics. Um, but I think starting out from um, the physics of equilibrium uh, glass, glasses, uh, you know, her career took a dramatic turn when she started to, to work on living systems, where she found that, um, you know, this kind of physics matters for such diverse phenomena as embryonic development, wound healing, and even cancer progression. Um, but to do that, you really have to push the boundaries of the glass physics to systems far from equilibrium because living systems burn energy uh, to apply forces and generate movement. Um, and it turned out that far from equilibrium, these uh, glassy systems generate quite intriguing new collective phenomena that she's going to tell us um, about today. I believe. Uh, and so for her groundbreaking contributions uh, to active soft matter, she received numerous awards, um, um, including the Investigator Award from the Simons Foundation, the NSF Career Award, and the Maria Göppert Meyer Award from the APS. So without any further delay, uh, I turn the floor to you, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you so much for that uh, really uh, nice and probably too kind introduction. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Um, can you confirm that you're seeing my slides okay and you can hear me okay uh, and you can uh, see my pointer okay? Okay, wonderful. <laughs> Every time we switch over. So first I want to say it's really great to see the diversity, equity and inclusion group before the colloquium. I was taking notes for our uh, committee and I hope we, we do something similar. That's awesome. Um, and I want to thank Oscar for that really nice introduction. And um, I saw today that my talk was classified as biophysics talk, so that's great. Although I think you'll find it's really a soft matter talk kind of in the end in disguise. So hopefully you'll call me out on that. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about what these videos are uh, now because I'm going to talk about them in a lot more detail later in the talk. Um, but these are, just to give you a little hint, these are two examples of uh, microscope images of biological systems. One is a biopolymer network and the other is cells um, from the lungs of human patients. And we're interested in the collective behavior of them. So before I go any further, I really need to highlight the people who did the work. In particular, most of what I'm talking today was spearheaded by an absolutely fantastic postdoc in my group, Ojan Damavandi, in collaboration with Varda Haig, another postdoc, um, and Chris Santangelo, who's faculty at SU. Okay, so the first question of the talk is, are you a solid or a fluid? Okay, and this is kind of worse over Zoom, right? Because like normally you'd be sitting next to your colleagues and you would shout out, you'd be so excited to answer this question. You would say solid or fluid. <laughs> and then I could say, oh, you're right. <laughs> because um, in many cases you can think of yourself as a fluid, you know, you have blood and other bodily fluids. And then you also, I think, um, if you think about what many of us think is our corporal body, you know, the thing that you need in order to do things like kick a soccer ball or, you know, carry a baby, those things support shear stresses. And so I think you think of your, you know, what you think of as your physical body, usually you think of it as being solid, like that's what allows you to do things like walk and move. Um, but um, during early embryonic development, uh, things can change. Uh, and I want to show you this gorgeous old movie now of zebrafish development. So these cells that are dividing are going to become the zebrafish. 
and they're sitting on top of a yolk. And at this stage here, the cells begin to move down the sides. This is gastrulation. The cells move down the sides of the yolk and flow over very long distances in order to generate the body axis of this animal. And actually, our development is very similar at these early stages to the development of zebrafish. And my uh, colleague and former collaborator, Eva Maria Schatz Collins, uh, made this beautiful movie. Uh, which is a close-up of what happens during that stage where the cells first start to move down. And what she's done is she's just stained the nuclei of the cells. So you're, you're looking at a group of cells that is densely packed. They're space filling, but you're only looking at the nuclei. So it helps your eye to see where things are moving. Um, and so this is what the movie looks like. So I think you can see that there's this beautiful jostling of the cells, overall a downward movement, but the cells really are changing neighbors and it looks very much like the flow of a fluid, right? And that is what allows you to get these adult zebrafish at the end of the day. Okay, and so this was um, uh, highlighted recently um, in a, a nice paper out of Oche Compass's lab that really emphasized the fact that Tissue fluidity, the global emergent behavior of lots and lots of cells in the zebrafish tail bud, which is that region that's elongating, is necessary in order to get that elongation. In other words, it matters that the tissue is more fluid-like towards the tail of the animal and more solid-like near the middle of the animal because that's what really allows that body axis to extend. And they did a very careful job of things like cell tracking to demonstrate there was actually a gradient in that mechanical behavior across the embryo. Um, another thing I want to emphasize is this isn't just limited to groups of cells interacting with each other. A lot of your body is actually made up of extracellular matrix, which is um, a bunch of different biopolymers that under a microscope look something like this picture on the left. And the interesting thing to me that I'll be emphasizing for the rest of this talk is they also have a floppy to rigid transition. And so Typically, as these things are created in your body, they're very floppy. But then it turns out that if you strain them, and that's what this axis, this arrow, sorry, this arrow is showing, is that if you take a floppy system as it's typically created in your body, and then you strain it, then all of a sudden there's a critical strain at which the system becomes incredibly stiff. And so that floppy to rigid transition is also utilized by a lot of processes during development in disease. Okay, and finally, um, you, you know, a very important area of research is understanding these interactions between groups of cells and extracellular matrix. Because um, it turns out that that's usually the paradigm for malignant or cancerous transformation of tissues, that the um, surrounding ECM, this matrix, this biopolymer matrix, um, really helps to determine um, the behavior of cells, you know, a cell collective inside your body. And so we do have some, some, some new modeling work on that cancer cell ECM piece, but that's not the focus of my talk today. Um, the focus of my talk is really trying to understand, you know, the fundamental question, how do mechanical interactions between cells and fibers or cells and fibers generate the emergent mechanics of a tissue? And, you know, this is a physics colloquium. It wouldn't be complete, especially because it's sort of condensed mattery without a Phil Anderson quote. So I'll say we are so accustomed to the rigidity of solid bodies um, that we don't accept its almost miraculous nature, that it is an emergent property not contained in the simple laws of physics, right? It should surprise you every time when you take a ruler and you push on one end and the other end moves exactly the same amount, right? That's interesting and it's hard to explain. Okay, and so I'll give you my favorite example of what makes this problem difficult first. So, you know, emergent properties are difficult to analyze, especially in disordered systems, which is the focus of all of this talk. So my favorite example is sand, right? And I could ask you the same question, is sand a fluid or a solid? You know, when you live in a nice place, so you can go walk along the beach sometimes. And of course, if you're walking along the beach, that sand is supporting your weight, right? So it's acting like a solid. 
Okay, but then as long as it's not too wet, uh, you can pick it up and let it sift through your fingers. And that behavior of sifting through your fingers is almost exactly what you would expect from a fluid-like material. And so it was just a very small change in the density of that sand that gave rise to that dramatic change in the emergent behavior. Um, and then this picture on the left is also one of my favorites because it is literally elastic disks. So how much simpler can you get than a pile of elastic disks? And what you're seeing is because these disks happen to be birefringent, these bright lines through a cross polarizer are force chains or chains of strong forces in the sand pile. And so the point of this picture is really that the, um, the emergent behavior of even elastic disks is incredibly complicated and depending on what you care about, difficult to predict from first principles. Okay. So there are many other examples, but I, you know, for this this broad audience. Oh, I just realized I forgot to tell you. Please ask questions. So nobody told you how to ask questions. And this is an interdisciplinary talk, so of course you probably have some. So if you have a question, feel free to just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask it. If you have a question, almost certainly I've missed something, and someone else has the same question. So please. Just feel free to jump in, or you can. I have the chat window open too, so you can, um, you know, enter a question there. It makes me feel like I'm not shouting into the void if you ask a question. So, so please do if you have one. Okay. Okay, but we're physicists, so there's a silver lining, of course, is that when you're looking at the statistics over large numbers, some features can be universal and not too dependent on the details of the model. So if you find the right questions to ask and you're looking at a lot, like a bunch of things, then maybe you'll get lucky and be able to predict something. Okay, so I've been working in this field, well, on this particular problem for about five years now. And I've had the same thing that's been literally driving me crazy is I don't understand what the fundamental physical mechanism that gives rise to rigidity in these biological tissues. Um, and so it's something that has been really upsetting. Um, and the, you know, the good news for you all is we think we finally answered this question. And uh, the answer, I think, is, is that biological tissues are mechanical metamaterials in a very specific way that I'll explain as I go along. But what I mean is that they acquire rigidity differently from standard examples or that example of sand I just gave you. In other words, there's many molecular materials such as crystals or glasses or granular materials um, that acquire rigidity in one way and biological <laughs> tissues and mechanical metamaterials acquire it in a different way. And that's what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of the talk. Okay, and in order to really talk about this, it required us to develop a new theory of rigidity. So that's what we did. Okay, so let me tell you first about sort of the standard theory of rigidity for standard disordered materials. And I'll use the, again the example of sand because it's so lovely and intuitive. So our intuition is, is that materials solidify as they get crowded. So as the packing fraction or the number density per unit volume increases. Why is that? Well, I'll use the simplest example, which is disordered spheres, frictionless spheres at zero temperature, which is called particulate jamming. Um, and it's, it's particularly easy. So if I have a bunch of spheres, like imagine a jar of marbles, then how many degrees of freedom are there? What's well, just the number of particles times the number of dimensions? That's the number of degrees of freedom. Okay, and as these particles get tight packed more and more closely together, they start to make contacts with one another, and each contact introduces a constraint. Um, and so if each particle has on average Z contacts with other neighbors, then the total number of constraints is the number of particles times this coordination number Z, and then I have to divide by two because each bond is shared by two particles. So that gives us the number of constraints. Then in mean field, we expect rigidity to occur when these two quantities are equal. And just like one line of math gives you that that should happen at this magical coordination number, Z is equal to two times the number of dimensions. And so our intuition um, is correct because at low densities, this 
average coordination number is less than that critical number and the system is under constrained. And as I get to higher densities, I make more and more contacts. And then when I pass that critical density, Z is greater than 2D and the system is over constrained and therefore rigid. Okay. Okay. And so this is a mean field argument, but surprisingly, it at works for jamming. It also works for sort of random hinge bar networks. And it also gives rise to a whole class of fun problems in metamaterials actually, that sort of are called topologically protected excitations. And the reason that you can tell that there should be something topological here is that there is a sort of uh, rank nullity counting theorem which I'll talk a little bit more about as we go along. So I'll just tell you what the theorem uh, sort of, I'll give you an example, a more detailed example, so we can do this counting for specific frames. So this is a hinge um, bar network where in two dimensions, and so it has four hinges, and in 2D, that means eight degrees of freedom. There are four bars, so that's four constraints. Okay, and then of course I have rigid body motions, which in, in 2D are just the two translations and one rotation, right? So that suggests that a framework like this should have one non-trivial floppy mode and it's under constraint. And I've shown you what that floppy mode looks like, right? Um, now, if I wanted to get rid of that floppy mode, I could just add an extra constraint. So here's the bar, that's my extra constraint. And now with five constraints, I can see that I no longer expect any floppy modes, okay? But there is one subtlety when I do this constraint counting, um, and the it has to do with what are called states of self-stress. So the idea is, is that if I now had two of these bar hinge framework together, I could be smart about how I placed those extra constraints and the system would be rigid, but I also could have placed those constraints in a dumb way. <laughs> so here's the dumb way of placing the constraints. And you can see that it leaves one uh, floppy mechanism. So this is, there's a floppy mode in my structure. And that instead, now I have introduced what's called a state of self-stress, which is a, uh, a set of, I can place a set of forces, non-zero forces, on this system and yet all of the points remain in equilibrium and that's the definition of self-stress and so what Caledine demonstrated is that well actually if I'm going to do constraint counting I need to count the number of degrees of freedom and the number of constraints but to get to the number of zero modes I also need to count these states of self-stress so that's the um, Caledine extension of Maxwell constraint counting okay but even with this extension, the point is that this does not explain rigidity in many under constrained systems. So this is some work we initially did with Matthias Merkel, Brian Teig, and Kasten Baumgarten. And I just wanna give you the simplest example in a colloquium. So the idea I have is a guitar string. And the game we're gonna play is you're gonna take a guitar string and you're gonna hold your, the guitar string in your fingers a fixed distance, capital L apart. Okay, and you all know that if I hold my hands sort of closer together than the length of that string, then the string is floppy. It can bend out of, out of the line and be very floppy. And here I've approximated it by a set because it's a little easier to think about mathematically as a physicist, is a set of springs that all have a particular rest length L naught, right? And so if this distance between my two hands is less than the sum of the rest lengths of all of the springs, then this will be floppy, okay? And then there's a critical, as I extend my hands, there's a critical point when exactly the length between my hands is equal to the sum of the rest lengths of all of those springs, okay? And that at that precise point, the system starts to become rigid. And then as I continue to pull, it becomes more and more stiff, which is why a guitar string can have a tune, <laughs> right? It has a pitch um, as, as I keep pulling it further and further apart, okay? So there's a critical point um, that I can either think about in terms of changing the length between my hands, the size of the box, or totally equivalently, I could think of it as changing the rest length of the individual springs, okay? Okay. 
And note that this is very different from the transition I just talked about in granular materials because I haven't changed the coordination number of my network, right? The coordination number is fixed. I just changed the size of the box. Okay, and I'm, again, in a colloquium, I'm not going to go into all of the details, but it turns out that origami um, rigidifies in a, in a using a mechanism that's incredibly similar to the one I just talked about for the guitar string. Um, and I, I'm sort of highlighting it because I want to get, sort of emphasize that this is what we mean when I say mechanical metamaterial. And so actually, I'm going to let my friend Itai Cohen <laughs> tell you what a mechanical metamaterial is because he does such a good job. So um, I'm going to play this and I want you to check. Uh, the particular paper Can you hear it that okay? wrote in science deals with uh, the Mira Ora uh, fold. Uh, this uh, is basically a, a series of parallelograms um, that uh, when folded into a sheet of paper, give that paper some mechanical properties uh, that are determined by the fold patterns that we put in to the paper itself. The nice thing about this uh, strategy for giving materials uh, mechanical properties is that by changing the fold patterns, for example, I can give the paper a different effective stiffness. I can also introduce new novel mechanical properties. For example, um, if I take a banana and I just squish it in my hand, that banana is gonna squirt out the other ends. But this particular pattern, if I expand it in one direction, expands in the other direction. And if I contract it, it contracts in the other direction. Okay, uh, so the point here is, is that mechanical metamaterials, their mechanical properties are generated by the specific topology of this, or sort of the network of folds that I put into the paper and not the inherent properties of the paper itself, right? So it's all about the connect, the way that I've sort of uh, uh, built the network of folds and creases in this material. Uh, the so I just wanna make the point next that a diverse set of biological tissues also do exactly this. So the first example, because I think it's the most obvious, is fiber networks or biopolymer networks that start out under constraint. Um, and so what I would like to sort of emphasize is that these fiber networks are essentially like the two-dimensional version of a, of a guitar string. Their energy functional is incredibly simple. It's just you have a spring and a rest length for each component of this network. And what I'm showing you here is data, I believe this is out of Paul Janming's group was the data I'm showing you here, um, where this is the shear modulus, so how stiff the material is, and this is the applied strain. And the point is, is all of these biologically relevant networks, if you just start them out at zero strain, they're very floppy. And then there's a critical strain, and that's sort of shown here by this dashed black line where the shear modulus changes by orders of magnitude. So note that this is a logarithmic scale here. Uh, and so this stiffening, right, is very reminiscent of, I would say, the strain stiffening of a guitar string. Okay. And then also I gave you the example at the beginning of the talk of um, zebrafish and then also developmental systems. And I want to emphasize it's not the point of this talk, but it's something we've been working on over the past five years, that confluent tissues, and by confluent, I just mean a biological tissue that's composed of cells where there's no gaps or overlaps between the cells. So there's sort of polyhedra or polygons filling all of space. Um, it turns out that those tissues generally rigidify by tuning their cell shape. And so just like that, um, spring network has a control parameter, which is the rest length of the spring. These cellular networks have a control parameter, which is the shape of the cell, it turns out. And in particular, the ratio of the perimeter of the cell to the square root of the area. So the idea is that if I have a cell that is elongated like this, it has a large perimeter relative to its area. Um, and this, uh, diagram is showing you that those set those systems with large shape indices, large perimeters relative to their areas um, are fluid like. 
it turns out. <laughs> if for those of you who haven't studied this, you'll just have to believe me. And then if the cells are more rounded, and so they have a smaller perimeter relative to their area, then they're solid-like. And again, there's a critical point when that cell shape index, which is again, just the dimensionless number made out of the perimeter and the area, um, hits a critical point, which is about 3.81 in 2D. And so if you, uh, uh, look, if you have cells that are above this shape, um, then they can rearrange and change neighbors and the tissue is fluid like and if cells are below that shape, then the cells can't change neighbors. Um, so that was some work we did theoretical work we did back in 2016. Um, over the past five years, we've really worked to make this a quantitative predictive theory. So this is some brand relatively new data um, on fruit fly. Um, so Drosophila fruit fly body axis elongation. So what we did, so we've, we've developed the theory more and it turns out that in systems that have anisotropic tensions, so anisotropy, so sort of like, you know, uniaxial compression or something like that, you not only have to look at the shape index. So this is what I talked about already. This is the same shape index is here, but also you have to look at the cell alignment, um, which is kind of a nomadic, almost like a nomadic order parameter. And there's a third thing you actually have to quantify. It's a detail. It's a, a sort of a measurement of the disorder in the tissue. But the point is, is that once you measure those three things, which you can measure from just a snapshot. So this is a picture of a bird's eye view of the fruit fly embryo. We say you measure these things and then this black line is an analytic no fit prediction with no fit parameters that predicts whether that system is going to be solid like or fluid like, okay? So that again, zero fit parameters, okay? So then what we did is we analyzed the behavior of the fruit fly embryo and you can actually count how often cells change neighbors while the body is elongating. And so this uh, inset up here at the top is showing you the behavior of a single embryo as a function of time in this parameter space. So it sort of goes out this way and then comes back this way as a function of time. But the interesting thing is, is that the color is telling you how fast the cells are changing neighbors. So blue means the cells aren't changing neighbors at all and they're behaving like a solid. And orange means that they're changing neighbors rapidly like a fluid. And so you can see that this no fit parameters line does a remarkably good job of telling you when you expect that onset to be. And in fact, if you average over lots and lots of different embryos, you see we fill out this entire phase space quantitatively. So I think this is a really strong indication that this type of model, I didn't go into the details of the model. Um, I'll show you in a second very briefly what the underlying model looks like, but I wanted to show you the data first because the data I think are very convincing that this model is really highly predictive of what's happening in real biological systems. Okay, and so the model is very simple. It's just two spring-like terms. One is a spring-like term in the area. So again, this is sort of, a, we can generalize it to 3D, but it's easiest to think about looking at a 2D pattern of cells, like an epithelial sheet. So a 2D layer of cells. And then each cell has a cross-sectional area A, and a cross-sectional perimeter P. And then I just have an energy functional that has two quadratic terms that penalize you from being away from some preferred area and some preferred perimeter. So again, you can think about this much like a spring, right? So if I non-dimensionalize these equations, it's just a spring. And now the parameter that governs everything is this shape, in, which is the, you know, the cell shape index instead of the spring rest length but the mathematics is the same. Okay. And so, you know, I couldn't help myself. I'm really sorry, you all. But I, I you know, as we think about developing um, bio-inspired materials, I wanted to emphasize that this ability to tune your behavior across a fluid solid transition is going to be really important for developing new types of materials that can do things that we want them to do. And so my favorite example is one from a movie that terrified me when I was a little kid. Do some of you know what this is showing? Maybe some of you do. 
So this is uh, Terminator 2. <laughs> um, and if you recall, what made him so highly functional as a weapon was the fact that he can transition very rapidly and at will from a fluid-like behavior to a solid-like behavior by presumably, you know, not tuning sort of some difficult to tune thing like density, but clearly he has to have some advanced control over the material properties of the system, perhaps very much like mechanical metamaterials. Okay. <laughs> so how do we generically describe this type of rigidity, this metamaterial-like type of rigidity? Um, and the point is, is that can, we can't, it, constraint counting won't work. We're not changing the number of constraints at all. The topology of these networks, the Mira Ori, origami, the biopolymer networks, the cellular systems, the topology is always fixed. So the number of contacts is not changing, right? Okay, so what are we gonna do? Um, we're gonna focus, I, you know, Oscar promised that I'm gonna be talking about active matter. I'm actually gonna focus on zero <laughs> temperature, First uh, today, I'm sorry, uh, but I can tell you what happens at sort of out of equilibrium and finite temperatures too, <laughs> but I'll focus first on zero temperature. Okay, so the old answer, there's, of course, rigidity is an old problem. People have been building things like bridges for a long time, so this has been thought about a lot, um, but the old answer is to focus on the geometry of a structure. In the canonical example are what's called tensegrity structures, where you have bars and cables, and so the important thing is, do these objects that make up my structure have to change their length, in which is bad, or can they maintain their fixed length in, in that structure? So the focus is on geometry. And in particular, it asks whether there's a global motion of the system that preserves these constraints. So like I have a hinge, with, or sorry, I have a bar which has to be a certain length. And so if the system does not preserve that length, that geometry, then mathematicians and structural engineers say the material is rigid, okay? Okay, but it turns out that the structural rigidity is an NP hard problem even for simple planar graphs. <laughs> so that's bad. So what folks, mathematicians and structural engineers have done is they've come up with simpler proxies for rigidity that are simpler than this NP hard problem. The first one is called first order rigidity. And it's basically says, well, there's no non-trivial global motion that preserves the constraints to first order, okay? And then of course you can do one step further and you can, uh, identify second order rigidity as well. So these are definitions of rigidity in the literature. Okay, so a structure is floppy if you can push on it without changing the constraints. That's the answer in the literature. But physical materials always have an energy functional. They're almost always quadratic in some bond or constraint. And certainly the two models that I showed you for biology, biological system, including the models for cells, and the models for biopolymer networks are basically sums of terms that are quadratic in a set of constraints. Okay, They're, the mathematical, I told you the form is the same. Okay, so for us, I would say for a physicist then, a floppy system is one you can push on without changing the energy. Okay, and so one of the points is there may be motions that don't preserve the constraints, but do preserve the energy, and a physicist would call that floppy. Okay, and we want to know when this happens, and also can we understand the mechanisms driving that type of rigidity. Okay, so now we've added a new thing to this column, which we'll call energetic rigidity. So something is energetically rigid if any non-trivial global motion increases the energy. Okay, and you might think that these two are the same, energetic rigidity and structural rigidity, but they are not. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. Okay, I'm gonna go through this really fast, but only because it's a lot of math and also because you all already know it from like first year mechanics in graduate school. So suppose I have an energy which is quadratic in a sum of constraints. Okay, so when I write this F sub alpha from here on out, this is just a constraint, a generalized constraint such as, well, the actual length of the spring minus its rest length for springs. 
Okay. And so if I have a disordered network in general, that gonna, that's going to give rise to a complex potential energy landscape. And we insist, which again is interestingly different from the structural engineering literature, because we have an energy functional, we insist that the system is minimum is initialized at a local minimum of the energy. Okay, so we insist that we're sitting at a mechanically stable state in the potential energy landscape, because then you can look at perturbations around that state. Okay, and then you do the usual physics thing where you perturb the coordinates, you look at the variation in the energy we will go to second order. Okay, and so the first term is zero just because of force balance, because it says there's no slope that I'm at the minimum, and then I get this second order term. And then our condition for floppiness is simply that there that I say that the, any delta x, any perturbation that I consider should not um, should um, if there is any delta x for which delta e equals zero, then the system is floppy. Otherwise, it's rigid. Okay. So many of you who work on this sort of stuff will recognize this second order term. It's what you know is the Hessian. It's just the matrix of second derivatives, or you know. Ashcroft and Merman, <laughs> the dynamical matrix, okay? Um, but the, I'm gonna break it up in a way that's fairly common, um, but nevertheless useful and instructive for this talk, which is that I'm gonna write it as the sum of basically a Gramian of the rigidity matrix plus a pre-stress matrix. And one point is that if I write it this way, it's interesting because this pre-stress matrix is only non-zero if some of my constraints are not satisfied in the initial condition. In other words, if there's states of self-stress uh, in my system when it's at its initial energy minimum, then this thing is non-zero, if and only if. Okay. So this other thing, this other thing, it's just the derivative of the constraints with respect to the coordinates. And it's an important object in all sorts of physics and engineering problems. It's called the rigidity matrix, sometimes it's called the compatibility matrix. It has um, the number of rows equal to the number of constraints in the problem and the number of columns equal to the number of degrees of freedom, which you can see from this definition of what it is. Okay, and then we can revisit constraint counting and demonstrate now that it is a rank nullity theorem. Okay, so the first thing you need to re recall is that a first order zero mode is a set of displacements that preserve the constraints to first order. What that means is it's in the right null space of the rigidity matrix. That's, that's sort of by definition of what the rigidity matrix is. So it satisfies an equation that looks like this. So it's just in the right null space of the rigidity matrix. Okay, if there are no first order zero modes, it's first order rigid. Okay, remember I also talked about those states of self-stress. Well, it's a set of stresses on the bonds of the network that don't result in any displacements. That means it's in the left null space of the rigidity matrix. So that's what this equation says. So this is the sigmas or states of self-stress, and they have to live in the left null space of the rigidity matrix. Okay, so then R, because R is an M by N matrix, and this is just a linear algebra problem, this you do a, the rank nullity theorem for the rigidity matrix gives you Maxwell Kaledine constraint counting. Okay, but that's first order constraint counting. Why did we stop at first order? We should not have, um, and, you, and you can do this for origami. There's this nice paper by Chris Santangelo, which actually got me interested in this problem in the first place. So a second order zero mode preserves the constraints to second order, and it gives rise to a much more complicated set of equations, actually, for the displacements that are allowed. Okay, of course, if there are no second order rigid modes, we call the system second order rigid. The nice thing is, is that you can actually take this system of equations, that, so this generates a system of equations, and you can plug it into something like Mathematica and check second order rigidity for a particular configuration using standard methods for finding roots of polynomial systems. So this is doable. So this is one of our, you know, mathematical worksheets for our systems. Okay. And then I think I, I, I've done enough math in a colloquium for today. So instead of 
going through more math, I'm just going to tell you what the math all says, because the question that we want to ask next um, is when does this first order rigidity or second order rigidity imply the thing that we really care about as physicists, which is energetic rigidity? Um, does it, what, what has to happen? And so the first thing we realized after, you know, a page, so, so there's an archive preprint where we go through all of the math and kind of a gory detail. It's like a manifesto. <laughs> um, but the point is, is that if this pre-stress matrix, it's very important. If it is positive semi-definite, then actually you can, you know that either first order rigidity or second order rigidity implies energetic rigidity. That's pretty cool. So this thing that we care about, energetic rigidity, can be explained by a simpler proxy, either constraint counting or second order rigidity, if we know that the pre-stress matrix is positive semi-definite. And in fact, we know whether first order constraint counting works or whether it doesn't work by counting the number of floppy modes, right? So we can look at systems and now we know either first order rigidity or second order rigidity works. Um, Although I will say there's a cool special case that right at the transition point, you can have a system, it turns out, that is energetically rigid, rigid but its shear modulus is zero, zero which is cool. <laughs> okay, but I, that's a detail. Okay, if the pre-stress matrix has negative eigenvalues, then the result, it turns out, at least analytically, is system dependent. Um, and we think this is really interesting for material design because thinking about exactly how this works, because if you can make a system that has negative, uh, where the pre-stress matrix has negative eigenvalues, you can actually think about swishing systems between rigid and floppy states very subtly and making materials that you know look like the Terminator too. Okay. But I want to sort of highlight, I introduced those spring network models and the vertex models earlier in my talk. And you can show that this is exactly the mechanism that's driving rigidity in them. <laughs> so that's really great um, because we've been asking for a long time, how, what mechanism is driving rigidity in the systems? It's not first order rigidity. And what we've learned is that it's actually sort of cost in second order to the constraints that are rigid, rigidifying both spring networks and cellular networks in biological systems. And that allows us to start to think about how to program cells or how to design biopolymer networks in order to change their material properties now that we understand it. Okay, so I, this is what I already said, second order perturbations to the constraint, which are quartic in the energy drive rigidity, um, in case there's any aficionados, you might ask, I told, I mentioned somehow a little tiny bit that energetic rigidity and structural rigidity are different. The point is, is that, you know, so it's sort of trying to compare the two. So what's an energetic critical point? What's energetically rigid? What struck this whole column is sort of structural rigidity. And the point is that these two are not equivalent. Energetic rigidity implies structural rigidity, but not vice versa. So it turns out that the system sometimes picks out a state of self-stress that is not the same one that would make the system rigid. And so you can have something which um, is, there, there may be motions that don't preserve the constraints, but do preserve the energy. And again, this is really interesting for thinking about material design. <laughs> okay. So I'll just go through um, in the last couple minutes I have left um, a few uh, pictures showing you what happens in these biologically relevant systems when you cross one of these rigidity transitions. So again, this is a picture of changing the rest length of the springs or equivalently the size of the box. Those two things are equivalent. And so if my springs have a large rest length, then the system is floppy. And as I shrink the rest length of those springs in a fixed box, it becomes rigid. And so what you see is a system that initially, so this is a configuration of a network that is floppy and has no tension. And then if I cross right over the transition point, just over the transition point, the system becomes rigid, it supports tension. And I can even watch a movie of one of these systems crossing the transition point. <laughs> 
And you can see that there's just a critical point at which the system becomes rigid. Um, and that is something that we can predict analytically using the theory of second order rigidity. And we can check a bunch of the mathematical properties that that's what's driving this one. And something very similar ha happens in these vertex models for cellularized biological tissues. Again, here's the cell shape, which is a lot like the rest length of a spring. And if you tune the cell shape, so here it is, the system is floppy. And if you just shrink the cell shape so the cells go from being elongated to a little bit more round, there's a critical point at which, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, at, the, at which the cells rigidify and the system acquires the shear modulus. And, the, and so there's a critical shape index at which this happens. Um, and again, you can look now, this is a teeny tiny bit of what Oscar promised you, is that you can ask what happens to these systems when you add um, either self-propulsion of the cell, so active, you turn this into an active matter system. So I've talked about the zero temperature limit, but we all know that the behavior of the low temperature physics is often governed by say the vibrational states or the underlying sort of low energy excitations of the zero temperature state. And we find in fact that that's very much what happens here. So this is if you just put a very small temperature, well, actually this is self-propulsion. This is self-propelled um, active matter simulation on top of one of these systems. If the shape index is above this threshold, and here's a movie of what it looks like, the exact same uh, magnitude of fluctuations but this system is clearly solid-like um, because, and I haven't changed anything but the cell shape. Um, so you don't have to change the global topology of the network at all. There's just a continuous tuning parameter. And as soon as I tune across this, I can change the low temperature, the low fluctuation, non-equilibrium or equilibrium behavior of the system dramatically. Okay, so in summary, Many rigidity in many standard materials, most of what we're used to thinking about all the time, is described by first order rigidity, which is why we, that's what everyone knows about. But rigidity in biological tissues is described by this concept of energetic rigidity. And in these particular cases, it turns out that it's second order in the constraints that's generating rigidity in that case. Okay. Metamaterials that are generically rigidified by this higher order type of rigidity are exciting in some ways because they do not require us to change the topology of the network to control the system. In other words, you don't have to fine tune like the crowding. You don't have to change the number of contacts in these systems. You fix the topology and then you change a tuning parameter to have careful control over the rigidity of the system. And it occurs when there's a state of self-stress do, and it appears due to very small changes in the, these parameters across a critical point. In these systems, it turns out to be a second order critical point, but okay. So, you know, then the outlook moving forward, I think, is that, you know, what is the space of design principles um, for these biological systems? Now we understand that they can take advantage of this mechanism for rigidity that is very different from the ones that are accessible to standard materials like crystals and glasses. Um, and so what can they do with that? Or can they sort of rigidify part of a tissue so it buckles and keep the other part floppy so it flows, right? It opens up a whole new space of thinking about how you should design things or how biology would go about designing things. Okay, I won't show you the Terminator movie again. <laughs> Great, so thanks so much uh, for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Lisa. Fantastic talk. Um, maybe let me, let me start off and ask you, um, you know, if you, if you look uh, closer at these biological tissues, which you didn't talk so much about, but it seems like just from looking at snapshots, um, you can you can well predict um, whether these materials, uh, at least in the case of the Drosophila of the fly tissue, you can predict whether it's fluid or uh, solid. I find that quite surprising. So 
Uh, do you have an understanding of why the dynamics doesn't matter or uh, maybe some kind of memory of what happened uh, to the tissue doesn't matter or depend, does it depend on which uh, question you ask, which, which property you look at? Yeah, there, there are two, that's a great question. I think there are two, it, there's a two point answer. The first answer is why is, you know, cause the model I wrote down is so stupid. <laughs> It's like just two terms and it can't possibly encompass the complexity of biology. So one way of interpreting your question is how could it possibly work given that it absolutely does not capture <laughs> all of the uh, complexity of the biology. And I think the answer is, is that there's a huge class of, I think there's a universality class here. I think there's a huge class of models that all basically rigidify at a very similar point due to very similar mechanisms. Because fundamentally, it's just an incompatibility, if you will, between the size of the box and the size of the objects in the box, right? And so both for springs and for cells. And so the idea then is you with this second order rigidity mechanism, sort of no matter what you do, because in biology, often you have a fixed size of the box, like there's a boundary condition or something that the cells live in. And so just by tuning slightly these parameters, they can basically like get into, I mean, one way of thinking about it is the entropy of accessible states, you know, and basically the end, there's almost like, for those of you who know about glasses, there's also, I think something like a Kausman paradox here, where you just run out of possible geometric states, the ways you can tile a box. And so I think all of the models end up doing this, which is lucky. So that's number one. And then number two is sort of, well, can you break it? <laughs> you know, and the answer is yes. Um, there's a couple of mutants, for example, um, where you can break our ability to predict things with a vertex model. And so there's um, a couple of hypotheses that we're working on to try to figure out what's going on. One obvious candidate, especially for these vertex models, is that the, the it assumes that it's so like there's a potential energy landscape in all of these problems. And our models assume that as soon as you get to the saddle point in a potential energy landscape, at the next time step, you start moving downhill. Mm -hmm. But in real biological systems, there's molecular, th those, those like saddle points also tend to be places where cells physically have to change neighbors. And there's a lot of processes such as like endocytosis of cadherin molecules and many things, many hysteretic things that you alluded to, where it actually, um, if you prevent the cells basically from being able to change their neighbors using molecular mechanisms, you break the predictive ability of this model. So in some sense, what one way of phrasing that a little bit more broadly is, it seems that the dynamics do follow gradient descent much of the time in these systems, but not always. And you can break it if you really try hard to get rid of the ability to go along this potential energy landscape. Thank you. Are there more questions? I, I had a question. Um, oh, thank you, Lisa. That was a lovely talk, just amazing. Uh, there's another talk in this series about six months ago about um, bonding in rock materials and the similarity between uh, um, regions of breakage in the rock, that the, that the rock will have a memory of that breakage if you break it like this and then move throughout the spectrum of break. Right here, it'll snag up. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, it seems related, but, but the question I was asking you, uh, wanted to ask you, you talked about tuning parameters. Uh, I believe it was the second order. Um, you said you, without changing the second, I believe you said without changing the second order parameter, you could use tuning parameters. And I, I was a little confused about, no, I think maybe it was out, without changing neighbors. Can you remember that about 10 minutes yeah. in? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think what I was what I was trying to say, probably not very clearly, is is that in normal sort of granular materials, um, like this picture I showed at the beginning of my talk with the sand pile, right? So I guess here's the sand pile picture, right? Um, it, it, the 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 sort of what happens is you sort of create this material in the first place is is that you change the contact network of the grain. Yeah. Right. 
And so what I was saying is in these sort of fiber network models, like this one, it, there's really the topology. So these things are cross-linked pretty strongly. And if you pull hard enough, you can break them, of course. But like up until that point, there's sort of geometric rearrangements of these things, but mm -hmm. the topology of that network is fixed. Mm -hmm. And so but by tuning parameter, what I meant is, if you think, so here in this system, you can, I think the easiest way to think about the tuning parameter is the shape of the box, of course, because one of the degrees of freedom is the shape of the box in which the system lives. And so mm -hmm. you can tune the shape of the box continuously, mm -hmm. and then you'll cross the rigidity transition without any change to the underlying network. And basically, the only way you can get that is a second order rigidity transition or something even more exotic. First but, order but, rigidity is not going to get it. Uh, how do you physically change, change the tuning parameter? I mean, what do you do physically? What would that so, correspond to? So for this, you just you, you literally apply like uniaxial strain. <laughs> so, right. so Oh, I see. In the sand, I see. So, so, so here, this axis, sorry, I'm, I have your picture right in front of my slide. So um, this axis, this strain axis is you're, you're literally just changing the size of the box. You're just, you're adding strain. But in these biological systems that I talked about, um, and I showed you an example from the fruit fly, we actually think that this system, because the way that biological cells change their preferred shape is by um, changing their expression of adhesion molecules and also mm. actomyosin. So, because of course, if you're in a confluent tissue, if you have a lot more perimeter in contact with your neighbors, that would suggest a much more adhesive cell type with a lower sort of surface tension per cell. Mm -hmm. Right. So if a cell had like a very low surface energy and it had a lot of sticky molecules, then it would prefer to make a lot more contacts with its neighbors. So we think that cells are tuning that parameter across developmental time. So, so the tuning would be the the, um, the eccentricity of the of the cell essentially. Is that okay? Okay, I didn't understand that. That's that's just what I wanted. Okay, and then but did you said I thought you said before that the the elongated ones were the more floppy, and now you seem like seem to be saying there's more adhesion on the floppies. I mean, well, on the elongated. Yeah, isn't that interesting? So, so there's a couple of subtleties there. Number, I'm going to say some biology stuff in case biology or any biology people are here. But there's a strong co-regulation of cortical actomyosin and adhesion. So it's not like one to one if you upregulate like cadherin adhesion molecules. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the actually cells work hard to maintain that the surface energy that they, you know, lose by having more adhesion molecules, they sort of gain it by adding more quarter, they add more surface energy. There's like a strong coupling uh, here. Okay, they compensate. Okay. But nevertheless, I am, and this is totally counterintuitive, absent of that coupling, it is true that naively, you would think that the more adhesion molecules you get through this mechanism, the system actually becomes floppier, which is the opposite, of course, of what you'd expect in a gelation transition in a material that rigidifies via first order rigidity, like a colloid. So yeah. it's the opposite of what you'd expect in a colloidal system. So how does that fall out? I mean, what, 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 what's, what's, what, we, why we is have, that? We have two oh yeah, I don't want to take up your time. Data. Questions in the audience, so Sorry, maybe you can ask later. <laughs> further questions. Yeah. So David. Ah, uh, hi Lisa. Thank you for a nice talk. Um, so you, mostly, what you told us about today, I, I think, was were systems at zero temperature, but that had a lot of disorder. Yeah. And we know in some cases that systems that are not disordered but subject to thermal fluctuations that those thermal fluctuations can renormalize mechanical properties. You know, David Nelson's taught us how crumpling up your sheet makes it rigid. So, so I'm wondering if there are parallels you could draw there, or if you can even just speculate what would happen with these principles if you did introduce some noise uh, that was thermally driven. Yeah, so that's a really great question. And um, we've done some work, although I'm probably not going to, um, you know, I, I, I think there are a lot of open questions. So I don't want to give the impression that we know everything. So one thing that we definitely have looked at is how um, in 
so, so there, you asked a question about finite temperature. And the idea is sometimes you can, as we all know, you can take like sort of a critical point, a single critical point at zero temperature and turn it into basically a cone, a critical region at finite temperatures because sort of the fluctuations can sometimes rigidify certain pieces like Xiaoming Mao has some gorgeous work on this, right? And so I think that there's something pretty, I would anticipate that something fairly similar to that is going on. And in fact, in spring networks, Fred McIntosh has really shown using um, um, effective medium theory. So it's not first principles based, but an effective medium theory does give rise to precisely that type of phenomenology in spring networks that matches with experimental data. Now there's another set of interesting things, which is also interesting in glass physics and important for biology, which is that when you don't have Brownian fluctuations, but instead you have active fluctuations, so the individual constituents have a persistence time, then you get a whole other set of interesting phenomenology that actually, it turns out, I think, generically drives you away from rigidity. So act, these active matter systems, like sort of basically increasing the persistence time almost universally um, destroys rigidity in these systems. It's a lot like shearing them, mm -hmm. um, it turns out. Um, and so I think there's a whole bunch of like open questions about how that, it seems to work fairly similarly, by the way, mm -hmm. in um, first order rigidified systems compared to second order rigidified mm -hmm. systems for reasons that I'm not clear on. So like the glass physics of these two problems is remarkably similar, even though they're, uh, vibrational density of states has some important and distinct differences. Mm -hmm. That is open. I see. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. So we have Jason Parker. Please unmute yourself. Hi. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I had a question, I guess, on so a lot of these you know, uh, cell systems and whatnot, they're anisotropic. So do you think you would have an instance where in one direction you behave more like a fluid and one where you behave more like a solid? Because this seems like a very sharp uh, divide, you know, very strong switch. Yeah, so, so it's a great question and I'm actually on the right slide to answer it partially, um, which is that although there are, so, I mean, essentially what you're asking is that there's sort of some evidence of like liquid crystal behavior, for example, in these systems uh, or similar. What I would say is weirdly, I don't understand why, but weirdly, there's not evidence for that. So this picture is actually showing you. So this is um, data from a highly anisotropic system because it turns out that the shape alignment parameter is basically just a pneumatic order parameter, except it has like an additional piece because unlike liquid crystals, where the molecules always keep the same shape, <laughs> so the, the, since the cells can become either more elongated or less elongated, you have to take the product of the pneumatic order parameter with something that measures sort of like the magnitude of how elongated the shapes are. And so that's what this Q thing here. You can basically think of it as the pneumatic order parameter plus something a little extra. And the point here is, is that the whole system rigidifies um, once you cross this threshold, independent of whether um, how anisotropic the underlying topology of the network is. Um, I, I, we haven't looked at it carefully. I would expect there to be like um, speed of sound to be different along the axis of a long, you know, elongation and along perpendicular. So I do think that you'll get sort of anisotropic mechanical behavior in the solid phase, but quite surprisingly, the onset of the rigidity is just, you know, either the whole system is rigid or the whole system is fluid and there's nothing in between. That's quite remarkable. Thank you. All right. Any more questions? If not, then let's thank Lisa again for a very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Clap our hands. Thank you. And see you, everybody, for the next colloquium on Monday next week.